Okay, so we're starting, well, we're continuing a little bit the, oh, we're continuing the misconception. Okay, so we're up to, we're almost there. We almost finished the whole, I mean, I assume there's always more misconception. I guess if I find new ones later on, then we'll add it, but uh, for now, we have still a few more to go, uh, but we're up to number 52. Um, so one of the misconceptions is when people say, you know, I mean, that's someone that everybody kind of struggle with is how much is in our hands and how much is in Hashem's hands. Because we have a tendency to say it's, it's all in Hashem's hands. So, what, you know, what can I do? You know, how much is in my hand? Some people will say, you know, okay, Hashem will take care of it. Right? So we think Hashem is going to take care of it. And uh, really, we, it's not so clear that Hashem is going to take care of it. It looks like very often God wants us also to do something, um, you know, about, about our lives. And that's touched upon Emuna and Bitachon, you know. Okay. Our rabbis explains also that it's a shitu, meaning that we are supposed to be partners with Hashem. There's a very, um, there's a question that, what, that is asked, actually, I heard a rabbi speak about it recently that says, okay, why did Rivka get involved with telling Yaakov to steal the birthright and everything? If Hashem said Yitzchak is going to be, uh, is, um, Yaakov is going to be the next one, right? Then, then Hashem is going to make it happen. Why does she have to go and trick her own husband Yitzchak and, and, and push Yaakov to lie and to go in all this twisted way or how to get the blessing? If Hashem said it's like uh, Esav is going to be uh, Yaakov. Sorry, is going to be the blessed one. Then Esav is going to be a blessed one. So here it shows us that really the reason why she did it is because what is the way? And by the way, it's the same thing with Esther. Same question with Esther Purim. Actually, we're coming coming towards Purim. Uh, Esther could have left uh, the, the place of King Ahasuerus, right? She's, she's a lady that she was married to Amor Mordechai and she could have left the palace and not put her herself in the situation where she went to seduce the king and sleep with him and all that's like, you think like it doesn't make any sense. What, what would you do such a thing? You're, you're a holy Jewish woman. Uh, you're gonna sleep with the, the king? Well, Mordechai said, if you don't do that, then Hashem is going to find another way to do it. Meaning that sometimes we're put in a position where, and we, we are given the choice. Are you going to do something about it? Are you going to be part of it? Are you going to be part of history or are you going to let history go by and you just being the observer? So we have that challenged question and that, that's the, the challenge that every day, like how much do I have to be involved when, if there's a war with the, you know, the war of Gog and Magog, let's say, let's say we have to fight physically. I'm going to just stay home, stay home and pray on my Siddur, or I'm going to take a gun and go and start fighting evil, right? So we know David Amelech didn't stay home and say Tehillim all day. He went, he took his sword and he went to kill the bad, the evil people. So we see that uh, sometimes there's a misconception of, uh, you know, if it's meant to be, if Hashem wants, it's going to happen. Well, maybe it's, you know, it, it, but do you want it to happen through you or you don't want it to happen through you? Do you want to be part of the equation or you don't want to be part of the equation? So the, the, it's a very fine line. It's, you know, sometimes you're not supposed to do too much. We know with the story of Yosef, when he asked too much and he said, oh, please remember, tell Paro that, remember me to tell Paro when, because he said that, 
he has to stay longer in prison because he he did too much. Sometimes it's, you you're you're putting too much in that loop. You 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 think too that it's too much of you. So it's a very fine line. I don't think it's easy to to always know. Um, but it's we need to be aware that. Oh, and by the way, I have a very beautiful thing connected to Hanukkah, connected to that. When the Hashmonaim, what the Hashmonaim, they they had they they were Kohanim, they were priests, they they were not fighters, right? And why did were they looking for the pure oil? Technically, they could have used Tame oil, impure oil, because when most oil are Tame and most of the people are Tame, then you're allowed, according to Allah, to use Tame oil. So why did they were uh, Dafka? They really specifically wanted to use pure oil. Because what happened is that they went out of their priesthood way, out of their way of um, usually praying and, 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 and learning Torah in order to, to fight, so to speak. And they went out with a sword and fight physically on that. And they say, we have become Greeks. We have become fighters with the sword. Really, the, the, um, again, the, for them, their fight as Juanim, their um, they, they could have think that their only way to fight as Jews is with the mouth, and because that's the one of the most powerful thing of 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 the Jew as a weapon is to fight with the mouth, and by learning and praying and you know meditating. But so they say we have maybe we have become Greeks maybe. They, ca they caught us, right? The Greeks were very known to push people to, you know, with the gladiator, all that, and creating all those sports events, making us be part of the entertainment. So maybe by doing this physical action, we have become, become Greek, and we should not have done that. So what did they do? They went and say, we got to know if the Shekhinah is with us. We got to know if Hashem is with us in the action we did. So they were looking for something pure. So something pure meant that if this oil burns, if there's still something pure, if and 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 we experience some type of miracle, because that's what they were explaining, they want to see if there's something transcendental. If the Shekhinah is with them, they're going to experience something very holy. As if to say, the, the oil represents their soul. Is our soul also holy and stayed holy bes despite the physical action that we did? Maybe we did too much. Maybe we were, we're not supposed to do that. But no, Hashem, clearly with the miracle, had shown, no, I am I was with you. What you did is good. Sometimes you have to take the sword and fight physically. Even if you're a priest, even if you're a Kohen, even if you're a very spiritual person, you're someone who runs the yeshiva, sometimes you have to take action and, um, and, be, and, and, and do more than just uh, using prayers and um, learning we should always do that that's that's a, that's a given so that that's um, you have to learn more about bitachon and I guess be observe with your own with your own perspective and the help of your rabbi I guess when is it that you have to to you know to do more than just praying and the, the Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg, that's how my rabbi's father, says that every prayer has to come also with an action. Um, and they say that also about the, uh, they say that long time ago, Jim Carrey, uh, the actor, um, in meditation, that if you meditate, you, you, can't, you can't say, oh, I'm just going to, you know, project some future vision of myself and just wait for it to happen. No, you have to project that vision, what I want, who I want to be, what I want to see, but you have to do some action that leads you toward that goal. You can't just wait and do nothing. So anyway, that, that's, um, that's something that I think that a lot of misconception about it and uh, we should you know, be very aware of that and try to be involved and in, in, in uh, the events, and not just uh, rely just on God only. Don't rely just on God. God relies on you too. This is the beautiful part. 
that God wants you to be involved. God wants to be part of his story. This is, this is the greatness, the humility that God uh, you know, has and allows us to be part of his will. By, but he wants us to choose it on our own. So it's a form of love and a form of, of, of you know, dedication and, and opportunity to be creative and do our own part in this world. All right. Um, number 53. Oh, so there's a misconception that when we pray or when we meditate, we're not allowed to have any images or um, pictures of, 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 um, of God, so to speak, or of, well, I don't know how someone can make a picture of God anyway, <laughs> but you cannot have any, you shouldn't use imagination images when you pray or meditate. Um, I'm not speaking about God's name, I'm speaking just like, so uh, about um, imagining, yeah, like, like God, like a father or something like that. Now, so there's a big debate about it. What are you allowed to imagine or not? Because, yeah, we know God has no forms and we know the spiritual world is just, is a metaphor. Everything that we speak angels as wings. Angels don't have wings, right? But we say that angels have wings because wings mean they can move from one world to the other. They can go up and down, right? Wings have to go up and down like birds. So they go from one world to the other. So when someone experiences something called angel in, in, in a dream or in a vision or in a prophecy or that, he's going to see wings because it represents the fact that the angel can go up and down. But an angel is not physical. So what, what, what are you seeing, right? It's, 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 a, it's a metaphor. It's a, it's a symbol of the true essence of the energy of what an angel is. Yes, Dolly. When David Amalek uh, was referring about the the wings of Hashem, was well, uh, we know that Hashem is everywhere, and and the, but but what is what what he was meaning really with uh, when he said that you cover me with your wings? Yes, um, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's a very good question. So it's a very good example also that um, when he says. That Hashem covers with the wings is because uh, when when Hashem um, sorry when, when a bird puts his wings he puts his wings around the the cheeks around the, the the little birds and it's a form of protection it's a form of love and covering it's covering against all the negative influence from the outside um and 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 the the uh, if i remember correctly is the eagles the eagles carry carries the birds um i forgot where they carry yes they carry the the the, 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 the babies on, on on the wings on the wings right because since they are the highest flying bird then the the bottom cannot the bottom birds cannot attack, so it protects it like that. So the the the, the, the wings represent that um, that form of protection, that that sense that God is protecting us and embracing us. So we the, the there are many rabbis. Um, the one that is I will quote is the one that I I followed mostly is the the Esh Kodesh is the um, Rav. Kalonimus Shapira, who wrote many books, very famous, Chovas Atamidim, The Student Obligation, Neymar Shavatova. He wrote a lot of books um, and uh, he follows the opinion of the Radak, the Radak, if I remember, Radak or Rashab. Um, Rashab. I think it's the Radak. I'll, 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 I will double check um, for next time, unless I have it here, one second. Oh, um, I can't find it right away, but uh, basically, one of the Rishonim 
And uh, he says that, yes, one is allowed to use imagination. Also, the, the, the author of Bilvavi Mishkanevne, Building a Sanctuary in My Heart, very famous author, um, writes about it. There's something called holy imagination and something called unholy imagination. Um, and sorry about that. So, so basically the holy imagination means that you're, you're imagining in a way that you're not creating, you know that's not the reality and you're imagining based on what the Torah teaches you. If you start creating imagination that is not um, based on the Torah and imagination where you you literally can create Abu Zara, then that's a problem. Meaning if you start imagining that really Hashem has wings or uh, like I said, the finger of Hashem, or you start imagining that angels really you know, have one foot or whatever it is, all those are images. The whole spiritual world is not physical. So, right, but the only, God speaks to us in the language of man. And therefore, um, this is the way we talk about it. So the idea is that we need to, um not forget that we can use imagination for prayer so for example I, when, when i pray sometimes i think god as my father uh, or sometimes I, 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 that he's like a king so i don't necessarily use a specific image but i i use the metaphor the feelings of what it will mean to be in front of a king or um or sometimes i imagine god as being my husband right and the idea is that um, by doing that, you, you're, creating, you're creating that reality. Our imagination creates a reality. The, the Rambam and all the books of Kabbalah speaks about the power of imagination, that really our imagination is much more real than we, what we think. Our imagination creates reality. And therefore, we're allowed to use it, in, but we have to use it in a holy way. Um, so you, you, we, unfortunately, most people were not taught that way, uh, to pray with imagination. Do you, you know, according to many, um, Kabbalists, when you pray in the, the, in the, with the Siddur and you go from world to world, you're supposed to imagine your soul, especially on Shabbat, especially your soul who has also different levels, Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chaya, Yechida, you imagine your soul going through a different world and coming closer and closer to God's light, to God's warmth, to God's, right? So unless you imagine that, right, uh, you, you are not, this is the step to achieve prophecy. So if you want to become a prophet, you got to use that imagination. Um, then comes a point where the, it, it transcends imagination. Obviously, when you are really one with God, there's no more. There's nothing to imagine. You're just experiencing. There's no. So that's that's the highest level. However, right, one of the misconceptions is that we should not has have in use images. But um, I I believe it's it's a big. Um, it's much better to use one's imagination. It's much more tangible. It's much more helpful, and you're 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 practicing, um, you're practicing what how it will eventually help you achieve prophecy. So um, there's a famous story of uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. No, uh, sorry, Rabbi Akiva, who went in the parlors. He went with his students into the spiritual world, into the four worlds. So Pardes correspond to the four worlds. So he went to meditation. He says all of them went up, but when they, they were there, each one, when they came back, one died, one became crazy, and one uh, went, uh, became a, a coffer, like a, an apost uh, I mean, he didn't believe, he, be, he believed uh, on, uh, that there were more than one God, one more, one more than one source of energy. So all, 
three of them didn't make it properly. Only Rabbi Akiva was able to go all the way and come back and be completely at peace. And one of the things that Rabbi Akiva was teaching his students, as, and they were very, very holy. You know, we're not talking about the simple people like me. We're speaking like very big, big, big. And he says that when you're going to see water, don't say water. Because what you see there is not what it is, right? So he was, Rakiva was saying that don't be fooled by the images and things you see because images are not real. Images is just a metaphor, a symbol for, for the reality. Everything we see in this world, right? A, a butterfly, a flower, you know, is, is, is like, a, um, how do you say? A reflection you see in the water of, of something. It's, it, it's, it's like the, the physical manifestation of the spiritual entity. And therefore everything you see around you is, is not its true essence. It's like my body, right? Myself is not, is not the real me. This is like a garment. I'm not gonna say my garment is me, right? So my body is, can become part of me, but it's not me. Me is my soul. My soul has 10 fingers. So therefore I have 10 fingers. My soul has uh, an energy called head that directs the rest. And that's, that's my head. My soul has something to see. So we have on the, on the physical world, we have something called eyes to understand all the concepts, all the powers of the soul. So that's why in Kabbalah, they speak about the 10 powers of the, of the soul, the 10 spherot that correspond to the 10 pounds of the body. That's why you have 10 fingers too. But it's not a class on Kabbalah, so we're not uh, going to go into that. But right, understanding that uh, imagination is very important and, um, and therefore that we should really... Um, Rabbi, so who we are, are, are is not really who we are. <laughs> or you're, you're we right. We are trying to tap into who we are through our own effort. Uh -huh. right? You're given an opportunity to become yourself, the, the, the real position of who you are, but by choice. God can make you already king of the world, right? God say, I want you to make yourself into a king or a queen. That's why we are in this world. God could have put us straight in Olamaba with all the angels dancing and singing all day and in love with God. But God say, I want you to be able to rise on your own, to create your own greatness, to create your own uh, royalty so that you, uh, you choose me with love. Even though you're in this world, you say, I want you God more than this world. I want you God more than, than and, and, you, and you actively show on the physical level that you want that um and you, you you don't let the body drag the soul down you say i'm going to take my body with me to heaven got it but, right thank you welcome so yes that that's that's why we're here we're here to 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 have our free choice the greatest gift is to have the ability to choose to love god god can you know god doesn't love angels I mean, he loves angels, but, he, you know, if I pay someone to tell me, I love you, I love you, I love you, right? That's very nice. Oh, yeah, I feel so good, you know, like, yeah, here another hundred dollars. Tell me I love you. Oh, yeah, I love you, I love you. Well, I feel, I feel pretty good, uh, you know, but is that real love? I don't think so. I commend you to love me. So you're going to love me? Well, I don't think that's real love. Real love. Assault. What? harassment yeah yeah that, that that's that's all that that's that's a that's rape you know that's why sometimes i call the rape judaism when you're forcing judaism on someone on the kids and so you got to do that because god saves so it's like uh, that's that's not that's not that's not what god wants god wants us to choose so we we teach the kids but the kids have to be taught with with love and with with choice and giving them showing them the opportunity that they have the greatest gift but eventually we have to choose, God wants us to choose him. That's why he says, if you, Yehoshua and, and Eliyahu Navi both say, Yeshua before they went into Eretz Israel and Eliyahu Navi and Har Carmel and Mount Carmel, they told the people, you have the choice. You can choose to follow the idolatry of the day, meaning enjoy this world and that, or you can choose God. 
but don't go right and left and right and left and not choose. That's the worst thing is not to make a choice. If you choose God, then choose God. If you don't choose God, then don't choose God. But it's your choice. If you don't want to be spiritual and religious and you just want to enjoy this world, go. Fine. God is fine with it. But, but you'll have only this world. You won't have the world to come. You're missing, you're missing out to... Because it's like the kid who jumping for the little candy because he has it now and when he could have a much bigger candy later, right? So it's, it's, it's um, that's why we Jews, we're, we keep hoping. I mean, we, we're, we're patient and we're waiting for Moshiach and Moshiach because we, we know all that time, even though it's painful, we're allowing ourselves to, 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 to wait for the, the great reward later for the, for the big candy, <laughs> for Hashem. So you can have something uh, pleasurable now, but it's going to be a bit uh, crappy. Or you can have the, the big, the best later. So we have to be patient. You have to let the body tell, tell the body, hey, you know, wait a little. You'll see heaven is going to be much more, much more pleasurable than earth. But uh, unfortunately, sometimes our body doesn't um, doesn't believe us. He says, "Yeah, I don't care. I want it now." Right. So that's that's a challenge. Not easy. Uh, and that was was the Greek. The Greeks was all about Hellenism. Yeah, here enjoy here. Don't worry about God. Just uh, yeah, okay. You can be Jewish, but just enjoy this world. You know, all those pleasures you think is for nothing. <laughs> so. Well, some pleasure are here. All the pleasure here are to give a taste, a sample. You no, know, we Jews we love sample. You no, know, one in the sixtieth. So you want a sample of, of the spiritual world. Well, what it tastes like. Well, you, you, the, that's the pleasure of this world. It's just to give you a sample. No, the, the sample is is not the actual thing. You get stuck into the samples. You don't get stuck in the sample. You want to get the the real thing, right? So this world is just a sample for us to give us the strength. Right? The Misila Seshayim, the Ramcha and Misila Seshayim says, all the pleasure here are only here to help you reach the ultimate pleasure, but you get stuck with the little pleasure of this world, then it's all for nothing. You, you, you're gonna live a life of samples. Um, okay, so that's, that's, um, 53. Well, I don't know how we got there, but it's all connected anyway, right? Okay. Um, but the idea was about the images. Okay, number 54. Oh. The misconception that Torah, real Torah, real, real uh, learning Torah, but, but for the for, for its own sake, Torah Lishma, meaning Torah that, that you don't do because you want some, get, to get something out of it, 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 it doesn't have to be enjoyable or it shouldn't be enjoyable. You should just learn Torah, but without any pleasure in learning. Um, and, and so that misconception came from, from well, a little bit from uh, Nefesh Achaim, where, where it says, you know, even if, if you don't have any passion or, 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 or love Torah, you should, should learn Torah because the idea is you just want to be close to God. But, but Rashi and many other places explain that a Torah that is not enjoyable, a Torah that is not sweet. And by the way, when we say the prayer of the Torah, the blessing before the Torah every day, we say the Ha'arevna, make the Torah sweet. We're saying that that God wants you to enjoy the Torah, and the Torah should be sweet to you. Sweet doesn't mean it's not hard; it's no effort. It means that it should it um, it should some be something that's exciting. It's it's okay to be excited to learn Torah, and it's okay to learn things that makes you feel good, uh, because actually, what feels good when you learn is a reflection of the things that that your soul needs to hear. Your, your soul rejoices. You know, each one of us has a part of Torah that we're more connected to. Some people is the low, some people is the Midrash, some people is the, the, the Torah, some people is the Talmud, some people is Kabbalah, some people is prayer. Each one of us has a 
thing that we're most connected to. And we have to learn all of Torah as much as we can, even the parts that are not so as exciting. Technically, there shouldn't be such a thing as a Torah that's not exciting. It, everything is exciting. It's that we're not always taught in a way that we understand that, that, that it's exciting. When you're taught not to tear toilet paper about sh on Shabbat because, you know, on the lines, because, uh, you know, lines you're cutting, you're making a measurement, you think like, uh, how is that exciting to learn about it? But if you learn about it in a way that you see, you understand how tearing or not tearing toilet paper can change your whole perspective on life, um then then you can become excited so the truth is torah um should be enjoyable and needs to be enjoyable because it's from god this the, is the greatest gift uh, learning torah brings you come to close to god so the, the problem is that um we we don't a lot of people are not taught how to make torah enjoyable um and, and for me, it's, it's so devastating to see how many kids hate learning Torah because they think that learning Torah is just going through the Talmud and reading laws and just having an uh, intellectual exercise to become smart. Um, fortunately, a lot of people, you know, yeshiva students, they learn in order to have a good shidduch. They learn to have a good name. They learn to have... Uh, good arguments. <laughs> what? Uh, to have a good argument against people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just to, for the sake of arguing in, in order to be a good lawyer, you know, and <laughs> and it's 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 sad because that's not it's not what it's for. That's literally shma. That's literally, um, you know, I mean, there are rabbis who learn Torah and 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 they, because they want to be called rabbi and for their ego and. Um, but, and uh, I, I I think sorry, Rabbi. Yeah. I think it's a different stages. Uh, about the Torah. Uh, for example, in my childhood, um, my aunts and my mother, they used to read the Torah to me when mm -hmm. I was sick. Right. And I was just learning, uh, that, not learning, but listening. And it was like a, um, my, my night book before I was going to sleep. Mm -hmm. It was a, a story, a different story each day. And, and and it was very enjoyable because I was a child. Nice. But when I went to the law school, I had to study. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 this, this teacher uh, forced us to, to study the Torah. And, uh, and for my classmates, it was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is, I never thought that, that so much blood. <laughs> oh. They were yeah. so focusing on, on all the wars uh, because it, we were studying the Pentateuco and this when the heavy studies. <laughs> but uh, but it's 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 different. It's like a, for right now in in my adulthood, it, I am in love of the Torah. It, the, my mom used to say this is the perfect book. If you right. know Torah, you everything is easy in your life. But you need to meditate, right? And sadly, many people are uh, uh, manipulated because they don't understand it. And I think is the the translation. That's why we are so sad when the Greeks translate the Torah because this is when all the manipulation came. Right. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Actually, uh, the the eighth of Tevet, that's when, which is soon, which is uh, what's the date today. Um, oh, it's here. Uh, today we are the yeah. So in three days, it is, you know, some say we that you have should have a three day fast, the eight, nine, ten. We only fast on the ten. But it's in, it's three three days of darkness, and I think on the eighth of Tevis, that's that's when the Torah was translated by the Septuagint, um, the seventy two rabbis in, in Greek, and the, that's when darkness came into the world, took took the pure oil and mixed it with the with the translations of you know losing the pure root of 
what the Torah really means. So, yes, that's um, that's very true. And there's nothing like learning Torah in Hebrew. Because it's like the holy language with the, all the all the light of the Hebrew letters. Um, okay, so right. So misconception. Well, we should not have the, the misconception fifty four is that we should not think that learning Torah cannot be enjoyable, and, and or that it's okay to learn Torah without joy or excitement. Torah should be learned with excitement and joy and and it is absolutely okay and um, as long as the goal is to come close to god and to love god more this is at the end the the true purpose of it is to be one and in love with god um and we have to be excited you can't learn torah and not be excited in that because it, it's it's defeating the whole purpose it has to be something positive so it's 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 lacking today and it's a misconception that we just oh we're learning torah so it doesn't matter how we learn no it matters because the more happiness and, lo and love you have when you learn torah the more excitement the more you your soul shines and it's a sign that your soul is shining and the more you're able to be close to god like one of the famous oh One of my one of my favorite quotes. Oh, I, I want to show you actually a few quotes connected to that. Okay, this is a quote from Abbe Ari Kaplan. Is that so? This is like that. Um, Neither Kabbalah nor philosophy, but experience is the proper way to serve. No, actually, that was not. That's not the one. Sorry. Next one. Um, the goal of all worship and observance is to attain a high. The law and halacha is a handbook on how to attain the highest ecstasy. Okay, that uh, I find it fantastic. He, 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 he didn't say the Midrash or the stories or the Kabbalah. He says halacha, the laws, is a handbook on how to attain the highest ecstasy. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it, it's it's better than any drugs. <laughs> Rabbi, the highest what? Ecstasy. Uh, you know what ecstasy? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So so that's um, not the pills. You know, not the pills. The name of the pill of the drug is taken from the the state that one one has. Uh, it's it, it's a state uh, where you have to see what's the definition of ecstasy. Uh, but basically, it's a very happy um like someone with ecstatic almost it's uh, i think it, i'm from it, the same root and it happens it well i don't know if other people but uh, it happens it's like a, in my times when when i read torah and then right. something in my eyes open i yes. see the full concept and i i read it hundreds of times but suddenly something happens and I, it's like a full of light your whole body and your heart exactly and exactly so that that, that that's that that uh, actually so here that's the definition an over an overwhelming feeling of great happiness or joyful excitement or an emotional or religious frenzy or trance-like state that's good trance-like state originally one involving an experience of mystic self-transcendence okay so that that's what we're supposed to feel when we learn alakha you know and so that's again this is um uh what the goal now listen to that the magid of mezrich which was um, a student from the bar shem Tov, he says like that the most important element okay it's not for me you know <laughs> the most important element in observance is the enjoyment one has while doing it okay um we actually see, so he explains, we actually see that enjoyment is the main element that joins two things. As for an example, a man and a woman who are primarily brought together because of their mutual enjoyment. Therefore, when a person observes a commandment, 
So it's not just learning Torah. Learning Torah, you're fulfilling a commandment, but learning Torah, doing any of the commandments, Shabbat, Pesach, uh, Tfilin, the candles, any, prayer. When a person observes a commandment, whether in thought, speech, or deed, the most important element is his delight which connects them. It is with this that one binds all the worlds to God. Because the joy, the happiness, the excitement is the glue, is the magnet. It's what brings everything together. If you love being with someone, you're excited to see someone, you're going to, you know, hug and be happy to be together. So that, that's what the Magid of Mesrich says in Ortora uh, Vaira, 28D. So very, right, um, powerful statement that shows us that it's not like, okay, it's, it's nice. It's nice to be religious. It's nice to learn Torah. It's nice to make a mitzvah. You will get reward in the world to come. No. This is, this is not, no greater enjoyment than to serve Hashem here in this world. You, you bind yourself to Hashem. You connect yourself to the spiritual world. So now, obviously, we have to ask, okay, how? I, know, I see those religious Jews. They look like uh, mummies. Uh, they don't look happy. They walk in the street like they like monks, um, you know. So, not mo a lot of people are not taught how to do that. Some we, we know people who are very holy. They're shining. They like they they smile and they they radiate, right? So, so this is this is really what we're looking for in serving God. Serving this is what the non-Jews are gonna see of, of the Jews. You know, in the future, they, they, they're going to they're gonna be inspired by, by just looking at us serving God and, and, sh and shining. And, and, and eventually, they're all going to want to do it. This is going to be the time of Moshiach. But technically, this is something we should have been inspiring the world already. So it's never too late. <laughs> you, 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 it is a reason the Pekhi Avot says we should make a bed called Adam Beseva Panim. That you should receive every man with a shiny, shining or with a, a beautiful face. Because if you're a man of Torah, a woman of Torah, you represent the Torah. And the Torah is something that transforms you into love, a love being, into a, a giving being, and a shining being, a, a radiating being, like the sun. So like you're shining like the sun. When it's sunny outside, everybody is happy. <laughs> that's why people go to florida or california right <laughs> in the summer when it's raining everybody becomes english and not happy so it's the reason why the light you know we speak about radiating the light you have to be like a sun you imagine your face is the face of the sun so that's how you should go outside hello good morning you know shining people's like whoa People have to put their sunglasses when they look at you. Okay. Um, and there's a beautiful here, a thing, a beautiful thing here. It says also on my quotes, the quotes from Rabbi Elimelech of Lizhensk. And Noam Elimelech, also one of the, the seven students of, of the Baal Shem Tov, says, um, well, I don't know if it's the descendants, but the, the, the students from the um, Baal Shem Tov's, um, students and he says pray constantly to god to help you and watch you so that sin not extinguish the fire of enthusiasm in serving god you know what's the big problem with sin with mistake is that it stops our fire to serve god technically you should be, your soul should be ecstatic you should your soul should be we're doing a mitzvah while wow, you're so excited, like a kid. Like, I'm going to get a lollipop. I'm going to go to Six Flags, whatever, to Walt Disney World. So the, the kid is so exciting. That's how we should be when we know we're serving God. So we have, that fire has been extinguished. When, when the, that's the biggest problem with the sin. We think sin, oh, you did something bad. You're a bad boy. It's not that. It's just you're you're doing something that is very physical and that, that's preventing your soul from shining and it's stopping the desire. That's the worst consequence of sin. That's why take, technically a sin, you're already punishing this world for the sin. 
because all the joy you could have have in serving God and speaking to God and and praising God, you you diminished you diminished diminished it yourself. You're you're not having the sample of of what it is to serve God in this world. So you're you're punishing yourself. So we should really um, be careful with that. Anyway, those are some of my favorite quotes. I have a thing with quotes. Maybe one day we'll we'll do a, go through all the quotes because they each one is like a powerhouse of a lesson. Um, okay, so. I want to do one more. So here we're speaking about, oh, not here. The number 55 is about the misconception that is, well, it's, it's connected a little bit to the number 52. What's really in God's hands is who, who the question is who makes his story? Is it God who makes his story or, or we make his story? So I, I look very much at Judaism as, uh, as, as the world, as history, as, as a chess game. At the end, you know, there are certain moves you can make, but, you know, God, like a computer, you know, programs everything. So there are rules and, and God knows every move you make. But even though his story is his story, you can choose to be an active actor in the story and to play the major role in his story, just like in the movie. You can be one of the background people, in which case you're just like more of an observer, you're just like an extra, and you're only part of his story. However, if you become an actor like Esther, we say like uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, right? At the beginning, like he didn't want to bring the Jewish people out of Egypt right he didn't want he, he says my brother has to do it and he lost he was supposed to be the Kohen Gadol Moshe Rabbeinu he was supposed to be where Aaron was supposed to be right and and Moshe said no no I, I don't want who am I that was the part of him that the humility that was even though it was the most humble there was from him we learn how this that fake humility no who am I what can I do I'm a nothing yeah, we know you're nothing. God knows you're nothing. <laughs> um, and you are nothing. But once you know you're nothing, you can still try to do something. And that something is, can be a great role, like taking the Jewish people out of Egypt. So, so even though it's God's story, we can still be part of history in a way that, um, that we become partners with God and that his story is also our story. Um, we, you, 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 can shape, you can shape his story. So you can shape his story, right? So that, that's really uh, the idea. I think it's, it's uh, it, for me, is, is the scariest thing in the world. The scariest thing of, and, and, and some say this is what Gehinom is, that we come to heaven and you see everything you could have done. That, that that you that could have happened through you and at the end yeah who am i i'm a nothing you could have saved maybe those people maybe you could have wrote, wrote this book you could have be the best doctor you could have been a, a, a great rabbi or a great teacher and what is that no not for me who am i i'm not qualified um you know, they have someone better than me. And, you know, the great people are the people who acted when it was necessary. Right? And that's what we learned from Avraham. That's what we learned from Yitzhak, Yaakov, Esther, um, Rivka, and all, the, all, all, all those holy people who took action and decided to be part of, of his story. So that, that's my greatest fear, not to be, not to recognize the moment when I'm supposed to act. We have more those, those moments, you know, it was at that moment. 
you know, we, we, we all have to find. Like Ruach HaKodesh? Yeah, so sometimes with Ruach HaKodesh and sometimes, you know, the, the, you, you got to get a feel you got, that, that is it in your ability to do? If it's in your ability to do and there's no one else uh, uh, available to do it and, and, and you're in a situation where it is, it appears that it's really for you to, you know, step up um, and, and do the thing, then you, you have to, you know, obviously you, you do it lishma, you do it for Hashem and say, yeah, I, 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 I want to do it for you, Hashem. I want to be part of making the change and, um, and, and do it and do it, uh, not being afraid, taking one's chance. What, what's the worst thing? The worst thing that can happen is at the end, you were not qualified enough. Okay, so it's not for me, but at least you tried, you know. Um, it's better to try and to do into an act than not to do anything. Yeah, it's much worse to regret. Right. It, it, it's, it's, um, done. According, according, according to one opinion, is why Eve, Chava, gave of the fruit of Adam. Adam wasn't sure what to do. He couldn't decide, should I eat the fruit, should I not eat the fruit? Chava, and he hadn't eaten from any of the fruits of the garden. And Chava came to him and said, I know you want to eat it. So, oh, you eat it or you don't eat it. But I know because I'm your wife, I'm from inside of you. I know really you want it. That's the path you want to take, the path of the etzadas, of experiencing the world through its opposite, going in, in, even deeper into the physical and come close to God, even with the physical, even with the body. So if that's what you want, do it, but don't stay here doing nothing. And uh, so she, she ate it and she gave it to him. Because, and why he didn't resist? Oh, no, I don't want it. No, he took it because she, she, he knew she was right. Rabbi, I have a question. If like, like someone like, Adam, like how, like he was, his ability, his power, like he was able to see everything, like how, how one thing affects another thing. How, like, what was his thought process? Like how, how, how could he not know like that this is not, you know, like, like don't eat the apple, like how it's going to affect them? Well, the angels made the same mistake. The angels say, why are you creating men and, and that he's going to be, you know, the greater than angels? Like, ah, ah. You're giving them the Torah that is holy. A man goes to the bathroom and he, you know, he burps and he's, he's like very physical and he does animal, st animal stuff. You're going to give them the to Torah? They say, well, yeah, because, you know, that those people can be higher than, than you. They, they do it by choice. Say the angels, the Isaiah and Zael, all the two bad angels that we speak about, you know, on, for Yom Kippur, uh, the scapegoat. So those two angels, we uh, call the Nephilim after who fell, who were sent to earth. Say, so, oh, really? You think you think you can you can replace men and make still the good choice on earth? So he sent them down and say that they got corrupted and they slept with the, the women and because they couldn't resist the power. So 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 Adam understood what it was, he understood intellectually, he understood on, on a more secha level, on a, on a level where um, that, that what was going to happen, that the world, by taking the etzadaz, it was a mixture of physical and spiritual. It was like saying, I'm, I'm ready to, you know, for my wife, I'm ready to do something very um, difficult, harder than than what she asked me to show her that i love her so you know what i'm i'm gonna you ask me for to bring uh, you um you know a little uh, puppy but i'm gonna bring you a bear you know but uh, do you know what the bear is he, he might eat you <laughs> so and she, and she never asked you for a bear she asked you for a puppy but you want to show like how how much you love her, how you're ready to take risk and to catch a bear and bring her a bear. I say, I don't want a bear. So that, that's basically, you don't need to bring me a bear to show me that you truly love me. So that, that's basically what God was saying. 
you didn't have to go that far in order to love me. You, you just need to have, do that one choice to, to choose to eat from the Etzachayim, not, not from the Etzadas. But our ego, our, and, that, and that was the problem because according to many opinions, it was a setup and, and it was not really bad that what Adam did. He wanted to show more love. What's wrong with that? The problem is you want it because of your ego. I want to show you love. Oh, so you want to show love the way you want, which by the way is a problem in every couple. I want, I, I'm, I'm loving you. I'm, I'm loving you. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. Wait, wait, wait. Languages of love. You need to love me the way I need to be loved. So God say, you got to love me the way I want. I just ask you to do that one choice. No, no, I want to show you how much I love you. With it. You want to be creative. You want to, that's, that's where the ego comes in. And when we want to do it our way, I'm going to show you how to love you. Or you're going to show me how to love me. Then you don't know how to love me. <laughs> so that's that's the challenge like people know i want to love god but without the commandments yeah i i want to love you but without having children with you i want to love you but uh, without you know cleaning the house or without cooking or without going to work that, that doesn't work like that <laughs> you're making your own rules of what love is that, that's not love love is understanding what the other one needs and the other wants that's true love so that's why we do the commandments God says, you want to love me? Here's the book with 613 ways to love me. Uh, more precisely, 248 ways to love me and 365, 365 negative commandments, things not to do. Your wife or your spouse, husband tells you, this you can do, this don't do, right? Then you know, so that's the same thing with God for the relationship. So that's... Uh, that's the history. <laughs> so I don't know. Again, I don't know how we got there, but all connected. Any questions? Yeah, Rabbi, I have one more question. Yes. I, I just wanted to go back to what you said about Moshe Rabbeinu. You said he could have been um, a Kohen Gadol, you said? Yes. But when, when God asked him to go save the Jewish people, uh, he refused for a whole week. He was debating. He says in the Torah, he, he debating and said, no, I don't want. And... Um, because in the, he had some good excuse, meaning he says, my brother was with the Jews the whole time. My brother, Aaron, who is he's older than me, he's supposed to be, uh, I, I, can't, I can't take that away from him. That, that's his thing. He knows the people, people love him. He, he stayed in exile with them. I, I went out and escaped. I, I don't want to humiliate him. And God said, no, you, you, you're the one for the job. But he refused, he refused. At the end, say, okay, he says, God got upset, whatever that means. But God said, you basically miss your opportunity. Now you're not going to be Kohen Gadol. You're going to need Aaron to now speak for you. You're not going to speak directly to the people. Aaron is going to be your spokesperson, and he's going to be the head of the Ko Kohanim. And that's why the Kohanim started from him instead of Moshe Rabbeinu. And Moshe Rabbeinu only... He didn't serve in the temple. It was Aaron and his sons who did everything. He was uh, Moshe Rabbeinu only the first week he was serving in the Mishkan. But then it was Aaron and his sons who did everything. So mm -hmm. he lost his opportunity. Mm. It's just, I don't know. It's just very scary when you think about it. If someone like him lost an opportunity, then like, who are we to like, you know. It's to show, <laughs> yeah, it's to show you that how, how uh, we all... We always learn from the greatest people because we have to yeah. we have to see that we are all vulnerable and we're all prone to make the same mistake, even the greatest, the most yeah. holy person. And uh, yeah, that that's that's why for me it's always very scary. But uh, that's I think one when, when we pray, that's one of the parts that we should always have in mind is like, God, show me when to act. Let me know when it is that I'm supposed to, you know do the right thing and and you, you have to trust yourself you trust your guts you got you, you gotta um not be a jew is not supposed to be that uh you know yeah underground being under, under underground uh yes we, we we are quiet but when it's time to be noisy we have to be noisy and that's that's what's going to happen with moshe ben yosef your your moshe ben yosef is going to make a revolution and he's going to have the people 
rise up against the, the system, the, the government, the establishment, whatever, and, and, and try to break all the, the things that, um, uh, all, the, all the negative things that exist in the world and in Judaism, and we're gonna have to fight it. And um, so you can join the war or not. Rabbi, so you would say that Moshe Rabbeinu, he didn't reach his maximum potential. No, I didn't. Um, no, I didn't say that. I say he, he. In a way, like he didn't. He, um, he, he could have. He lost that that specific opportunity. He lost. I mean, he he became the greatest prophet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but he definitely. But he could have been. But to max to say that he maximized his potential in in the world at that time. Uh, like, yes, yes, I would say he lost that uh, that opportunity. I think. I think it's fair to say that he probably repented and in teshuva after. So when we know when we do teshuva, you can regain what you lost if you understand it, right? And and you recognize it. So uh, teshuva is returning to your true great self, recognizing who you truly are. That's what teshuva is. So. Because um, I'm just trying to like, because I feel like, uh, this question always comes up for me is free will, the concept of free will. Like if he didn't maximize his, like let's say if even if that was his mission and he didn't maximize his potential or, you know, and then he's gonna come back like reincarnated or whatever. Like, I, I, you understand my question? I don't even know if I'm saying it properly. Like it's just, but like how, so then the question is like how much of free will do we really have? Like, well, you, like you have a lot you have a lot of free will mm -hmm. but 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 no you, the true free will will come only at certain moments in your life do you have free will as to what what you know what food you like what what's your favorite color what's you know what people you like or even how, how much money you're gonna get all that like Oh, it says, I call Bidi Shamaim. Everything is really in the hands of Hashem. You, you are pre programmed to be already a certain way. You, you have this nature, you're born under these stars, you have this nature, these character traits. You're so you're already set up in many ways. The only thing is, there are going to be times where you can transcend all that. You can transcend all the stars, you can transcend history, you can transcend the. That's, that, that's why my rabbi explains, and it's not just from him, you can rewrite the script. There's the script of, of the stars, of the, of the, of the, of the horoscope, right, right? You can just look at the horoscope and just follow what this, what he says about you. Or you can literally go beyond it and, 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 and transcend the na natural flow of things. That's the power of the wheel. Wheel power can help you uh, transcends, trans, transcend the, the, the natural elements, the physical elements, um, and your own nature. So you have, uh, you have certain times where you're given the opportunity to do that and to be an active actor of creation. Uh, and I, I believe God puts those things at certain times for you to be able to tap into it. And the key is to try to recognize it and to be aware. Um, and, and yeah, and and, and jump, jump into it, you know, like that, that. Take uh, take the first step before anybody want anybody else. Like Nachshon Ben Aminadav, the first one who went into the water till the till till the, the nose, yeah. and that's what happened. So you have to understand all those people in the Tanakh, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu, Abraham, Nachshon Ben Aminadav, David Amelech are all parts of us we all have those entities in us the good and the evil the haman the amalek also is part of us all those concepts in the torah those are energies and concepts that are part of our being and those forces exist in us and we have to battle those forces and say today i'm going to be moshe rabinu fighting amalek and today i'm going to be avram fighting sodom and Right, so so it's uh, Yaakov fighting Esav and all that. So we have those. Uh, we're pulled in different directions. Yeah. Got so it. we're an entire universe. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. So I just want to finish with um, 
when I was late. Okay, so just finish quickly. I just want to share something because it's something that on Hanukkah, uh, it gave me, I know it, it was almost like a, a light. We know we have the different sefirot and we know that certain actions activate certain energies, certain powerful spiritual transcendental energies. And what came really to me is that what was the, was, was based on different, teachings I was listening to, but what is the power of, of Hanukkah? The power of Hanukkah, it, it, it helps us tap into the Sphira Hod, right? Hod, Hod is the energy of gratitude, is the energy of uh, uh, um, glory. When, when, you, when you see the glory and you, you, you mode, my modim in, in the prayer, we are recognized and we celebrate and we rejoice and we are recognizing the beauty and the, the goodness and the love that God gives us. What Hanukkah was about, what, the energy we can tap into it is that when you actually live on the level where you recognize that everything that happened is a gift from God, meaning you start having a level of gratitude you live your day and your life, lehodot lehalel, right? In in a way that you are gonna sing your life like David Amelech do did, and you're gonna write song for God, and you're gonna celebrate every moment of your life, right? Which is Tehilim. David Amelech celebrate every moment of his life. Then you are that moment tapping into the energy, hold, and that's gonna help you trans connect to transcendental forces, to the energy of the sphere of hood. And, and, and that's what happened at Hanukkah. There was, you had that, uh, those miracles. Because basically when you pay attention and recognize that everything is really from God, it's not just nature, and you see the, the good in it, you are gonna able to see more. That's why we, on, on, on Hanukkah is, we put the candles of Hanukkah and we just watch it. Just lirotan bilvad, just to watch it. You're not allowed to use it for light or for just to look at the light because it's all about learning how to look. Like Moshe Rabbeinu saw the burning bush, he turned and he saw there was something. He could have left. We say, no, no, let me check what this is. There's something transcendental there. Also, it connects to sameach, someone who is happy. Is someone truly happy? Is shamches there? Sham means there, and Ches, the letter Ches is number, is the eighth letter, no, Gematria eight. There, there is number eight. There is something transcendental. There, there is the eight candles of Hanukkah. That it's learning how to see nature and to see the natural and how the natural and nature really comes from the transcendental, comes from the spiritual. And when you're able to see that, you are given the gift of being able to see God in nature, you're able to see the miracles of the natural. You're making, you're making the ordinary uh, extraordinary. So that's, that's something that, that was very powerful for me is that the more I'm becoming someone that is grateful and see the goodness and the actions of God in the world, the more I'm transforming myself into a being that lives in the world that is supernatural. That's why the Kohanim experience, the, the Hashmonaim experience that extraordinary war. And therefore, everything's possible. Even a little, a little bit of oil, oil can, can transform itself into a lot of oil. The, everything, all the potential becomes beyond. All of nature becomes a potential for to transcend and achieve tremendous uh, spirituality and, and uh, miracles. So that's that was my uh, little bit my highlight of of this uh, Hanukkah. Every holy day that we experience is to re reveal another sphere, another area where we can connect and tap into su supernatural energies that exist. But we have to do it the, the 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 right way. And this way on Hanukkah was specifically the idea of having gratitude, of seeing the good in things start with other people being grateful to our parents grateful to our uh, spouse grateful to our kids grateful to to the universe to god and then 
and then then we're able to um god allows us by doing that god allows us to be to see things um how they really are to see miracles every day so may we all be able to experience miracles and to see the transcendental in the ordinary amen thank you rabbi so much my pleasure class <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much shabbat shalom to all of you shabbat shalom rabbi thank you so much my pleasure i'm sorry for last week i missed you all i'm sorry it was a bit tricky. we miss you too <laughs> <laughs> and, and rabbi so, what yeah i'm sorry no no no. i'm sorry all right go go no i was gonna say what are we learning after um misconception oh that's a good question so um can we have a vote <laughs> Uh, we can have vote. Well, do you, do you, are you proposing uh, something? Um, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've 